What's up everyone? This video will be about case hardening of iron, steel, and steel alloys. The focus will largely be on diffusion case hardening like nitride and nitrocarburization. I am currently, as of mid-2025, building a pistol. I wanted my slide frame and some small parts to be nitride treated. I got pretty confused when trying to identify what the common firearms finish known as nitride is and where I could have that service done. There are a number of diffusion case hardening processes colloquially referred to as nitride. It turns out the finish we generally call nitride on a firearm, also referred to by different names like tenifer or melanite, is a molten salt bath ferritic process that is followed by a quench in a lower temperature oxidizing salt bath. Then it can be polished and quenched again, making it a QPQ process. I wanted to include this information in an upcoming episode of my Double Stack 1911 build series, where I will discuss why I chose nitride over DLC. As I got into the weeds and gathered more information, I figured it would be best to make a separate video that contains this sort of background information. In the description, I will link to a bunch of resources. I will try to title and organize them appropriately. I will be referring to some common phases of the iron carbon system. There's a link for more info on that as well. Timestamps will be provided as always, so you can skip around as you please. Let's get into it. Starting with case hardening, but within the context of this video, that is, as it relates to iron, steel, and steel alloys. Case hardening is basically making the outside of some metal harder, creating a case around the softer core. It is important to note that this is not a coating. This is a treatment that modifies the structure and properties of the surface of the material, not something added on top of the surface of the material. Case hardening can be achieved by heating the metal rapidly, via flame or induction to a higher temperature than quenching it, usually in water or oil. This results in a phase change at the surface to a harder crystalline structure. The steel should ideally have more than about 0.3% carbon content for this to be most effective. This is more often localized to certain areas of a part, such as the teeth of a gear, and doesn't create a continuous case. For that reason, it's referred to as differential heat treatment, and we won't be considering it here. Case hardening by diffusion is the focus of this video. That is the process by which atoms of other elements, typically nitrogen and carbon, are diffused into the surface of iron or steel. The atoms situate themselves into the alloy matrix or crystal structure interstitially or by occupying vacancies. They can also collect around grain boundaries. This is usually done to increase hardness, strength, wear resistance, fatigue resistance, and or corrosion resistance. Case hardening is more commonly done to steel and alloy steels containing less than 0.3% carbon as those cannot be easily heat treated to increase hardness, but it is also done to higher carbon content alloy steels for many applications. Carburization is the diffusion of only carbon into the surface. This increases hardness and wear resistance. Throughout history, case hardening has been synonymous with carburizing. In ancient times, it was used to increase the hardness of weapons like swords. It was likely done by packing or heating the blade in a fire or forge surrounded by bone or charcoal, you know, some carbon containing material and then quenching it. When we think of case hardened firearms, we usually think of color case hardening like this, an absolutely beautiful finish. The color is a result of the quenching. I'll link to a couple cool videos about this process. Nitriding is the diffusion of only nitrogen atoms into the material. Nitrocarburization is the diffusion of both nitrogen and carbon atoms into the material. The concentration of the nitrogen and carbon will vary by process and material. Boriding is the diffusion of boron atoms into the metal. This is commonly used on steels, but it can also be used on nickel super alloys, cobalt alloys, and some ceramic metallic compounds. Pretty cool stuff. Of course, there are a lot more details surrounding all the processes I'm about to cover. There are a multitude of reasons why one may be chosen over the other. I'm really just scratching the surface here, and I'm not an expert. There is a lot more info contained in the sources I provided. Packing is surrounding the part with a source of the atom that will diffuse into the surface. This is historically how case hardening and carburization of iron was done. I mentioned this a minute ago. In a gas process, the part is heated in a chamber so that it will allow the diffusion of atoms into the surface. The atoms of the diffusing elements come from a donor gas in the chamber. For example, in gas nitriding, nitrogen atoms usually come from the decomposition of ammonia gas, NH3, at the surface of the heated part. Carbon nitride is a specific type of gas nitrocarburization that diffuses a higher concentration of carbon into the material. This is a higher temperature austenitic process resulting in a phase change. I'll explain that more in a little bit. 
Nitrotech is the trade name of some specific patented gas nitrocarburization processes. It can be done below or above the critical phase change temperature depending on the material and requirements and includes a water-based quenching bath. There's also an oxidization step after nitrocarburizing which increases corrosion resistance and gives it a black finish. It can be sealed for further durability. There is also a polishing option before the final oxidization, similar to the QPQ process of some salt bath treatments. I mentioned carbon nitride and nitrotech because they're relatively common in industry. I come across them semi-frequently in my work. A plasma or ion process uses an intense electrical field to ionize gas at the surface of the part and allow its diffusion into the material. Pure nitrogen would likely be used instead of ammonia gas in the case of nitriding. An intense electrical field allows for the diffusion, not the high temperature and decomposition of another gas. This is usually done at a lower temperature than other processes. In a salt bath process, the parts are submerged in an aerated molten salt that heats the part and provides the atoms for diffusion. This may also be referred to as liquid nitride. There's an important distinction in the gas and salt bath processes based on process temperature. A ferritic process happens at a lower subcritical temperature, leaving the steel in the ferritic phase. This provides better dimensional stability. The case is usually thinner and less durable than the next process. Austenitic case hardening happens above the critical temperature, meaning a phase change occurs to austenite. Usually the part will be quenched and rapidly cooled, resulting in a martensitic or bainitic structure. This is generally used where more durability and wear resistance are required. How do the ferritic and austenitic processes affect non-ferritic alloys like austenitic and martensitic stainless steels? I'm not quite sure. I think both processes can be used on those alloys. Maybe their effectiveness and results would vary. Let me know if you know. Carburizing, nitriding, or nitrocarburizing alone does not make the steel black. After one of these processes, the surface of the steel will likely be an ashy, light or medium gray silver color. What turns the surface black is an oxidization post process. This can be done in plasma gas and salt bath processes. In plasma and gas processes, a donor gas containing oxygen would be introduced into the chamber after the case hardening. The reaction at the surface results in black iron oxide formation, Fe304, also known as magnetite. In addition to looking nice, this provides more corrosion resistance. I want to spend a little bit more time on salt bath processes as that is what is most applicable to my current project. Salt bath processes can occur at different temperatures that may or may not cause a phase change, hence the delineation of ferritic versus austenitic processes. I've heard the term cyaniding used to describe a type of case hardening. It also appears to be a molten cyanide salt bath. Salt bath nitride is known for its hardness, durability, wear resistance, low coefficient of friction, and corrosion resistance. If an oxidizing post process is used, it will be more corrosion resistant than hard chrome or electrolysis nickel plating. There is a link in the description that discusses the results of a salt spray test on hard chrome and nitride treated parts. The oxide layer will have some microporosity, which will help retain oil. The diffusion layer under the compound or white layer improves fatigue resistance. I'll get more into the specifics in the upcoming episode of the 1911 build series where I make the comparison to DLC. A cyanide is a compound that contains this little fella, a cyano group. This is a carbon atom triple bonded to a nitrogen atom, a covalent bond sharing three pairs of electrons. When a positively charged metal cation bonds with a negatively charged cyanide anion, a cyanide salt is formed. It seems potassium cyanide or sodium cyanide salts are the basis for the salt bath and the nitrocarburization process as they handily contain both nitrogen and carbon atoms. Here's where I get confused about the naming of nitride versus nitrocarburization. Salt bath processes are usually referred to as nitride, technically meaning the diffusion of only nitrogen. I think the lower temperatures associated with the ferritic processes impede the diffusion of carbon atoms, maybe completely, maybe not. So possibly salt bath nitride isn't a misnomer for certain processes. I'm not really sure. Let me know if you know. If there is a post-process oxidizing step, the oxidizing quench bath chemistry may contain sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate, sodium nitrate, or sodium hydroxide. Manufacturers keep their salt chemistry close to their chest for obvious reasons. It's uh, either patented or a trade secret, so they wouldn't publish specifics. There are a number of different salt bath processes. It seems that 
over the years, different processes and chemistries have been developed and experimented with. I don't know which ones were invented or patented by whom or at what time or how ownership of them has changed, but it seems today the rights or trademarks to many common salt bath processes are owned by Hef du Ferret USA or the Hef Group. Their website is a great resource and that's where I got the following information. Let's start with r -Core. They differentiate a ferritic and austenitic process. Then they list one also known as sur -Sulf. They claim this is the original salt bath nitriding process. It uses sulfur activated non-contaminating salts, whatever that means. None of the r -Core processes lists an oxidizing post-treatment. Now we come to the most common ones, melanite, tenifer, and tough tried. Hef owns the rights to all of them. They state that they are identical processes, presumably with identical salt chemistry. That chemistry is different from r -Core process chemistry, but they claim the properties of the surface layer are equivalent for most applications. Melanite is the name in North America. Tough dried and tenifer are used elsewhere in the world. I have seen some claims that the chemistry of melanite in the U.S. is different to elsewhere in the world due to environmental regulations, but I don't think that is accurate. I have read that the first pistol to use salt bath nitride treatment, specifically tenifer, was Glock on their pistol slides. The parts are preheated in an air furnace, then put in the melanite-specific salt bath. After that, the parts are treated in an oxidizing bath, then water-cooled in rinse. I think this oxidizing bath does a few things. It is at a lower temperature than the initial salt bath, so it may help control the cooling of the part, minimizing warping or distortion. This will be less of a concern with a lower temperature ferritic process. The melanite salt bath is at 1,075 degrees Fahrenheit, according to Hef, below the transition temperature in steel to austenite that occurs around 1,300 Fahrenheit. So I'm assuming this is a ferritic process. It might also help neutralize uh, any remaining cyanide salts on the surface of the part from the previous bath. It transforms two to three microns of the surface to black iron oxide, further enhancing corrosion resistance. The optional impregnation step they list to enhance corrosion resistance is likely some sort of sealant, uh, maybe like the one that is optional in the NitroTech treatment. I've heard melanite simply referred to as QPQ, but QPQ is a specific set of secondary steps after the liquid nitride process. It stands for quench, polish, quench. It seems melanite will always have the first oxidizing quench bath, so the first Q seems baked into the melanite process. After that, it can be polished. This is the P step. For irregularly shaped objects, the polishing will likely be done by tumbling in fine media. Polishing is done to improve the surface finish. This will enhance friction properties, reduce the coefficient of friction, and it makes it look nicer, but may also improve corrosion resistance as rough surfaces provide more nucleation points for oxides to form. The polishing will remove some of that oxide layer from the first Q, so the final Q or quench is used to restore the oxide layer thickness, providing maximum corrosion resistance. All right, well, that's about what I wanted to cover in this one. Uh, hopefully some good background info and a primer for the upcoming DLC versus nitride discussion. Clearly there are lots of gaps in my knowledge regarding these processes and treatments. However, I was able to figure out that salt bath nitride, specifically the melanite QPQ process as it's named here in the States, is the most common finish referred to as nitride on firearms. I found a service provider and sent off my parts. I still have probably another five to seven weeks to go until I get my parts back. The next video in the Double Stack 1911 build series won't be published till after that. Thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.